Okay, people, good day. So I'm going to see if I can't try to do a little bit of a shout out today, and I'm going to follow the discussion that I put up from just, I guess, a couple of days ago on matter, energy, and information, and on the different levels of information. And the two books that I referenced in that video that I'm going to talk more about right now, and, you know, I've tried to really keep all of my videos here on YouTube to be chit-chat and, uh, when I say, you know, Attempts at user friendly, you know, we, we, we don't have texts that we share. Now we did do some reading stuff before, but here are the books. You know, one is called Grammatical Man, Information, Entropy, Language, and Life by Jeremy Campbell. And the other one, again, I can't recommend either of these enough. This so one's called The Rules Are No Game, The Strategy of Communication, and that's by Anthony Wilden. And what I want to do is talk more about the problem of, of separating the knower and the known once you move to the level of information and the exemplar is the issue of probability. See, probability is the key problem because probability plays into the definition and the way that we understand entropy and the second law of thermodynamics. Now, How do I say? Okay, let's let's try it like this. Say I say to you, say I have a penny, and I say, what are the odds of me flipping that penny and getting ahead? Now you're likely to say, and you would be right, <laughs> that it's 50%. You have a 50% chance of getting it. But say I say to you right now that you as you just entered the room and I have the penny and I'm about to flip it and I say what are the odds that it's I'm going to flip ahead and I say to you what if I told you though that right here right before you entered the room I have just flipped it nine times in a row on heads and this would be in fact the tenth head in a row if I would flip it and it would be heads would you change your bet now many people both gamblers and scientists would change their bet and they would change it on the grounds that it seems so unlikely that you would have 10 heads in a row. Now the coin doesn't have any memory and so the gambler foolishly thinks, I guess in some way, that it's, you know, it, it just has to come up tails this time. There's no way that it couldn't Whereas, you know, the mathematician would say, well, no, there's a, there's a law of large numbers that comes into play. And the, the rare event already occurred. Yeah, the rare event was the prior nine, you know, heads in a row. The odds of flipping the coin remain 50-50. And yet, there is a tendency to want to say, well, there's no way that within this consecutive sequence, it would hit another head. Now I bring this up because probability depends upon context and upon memory. And although probability and, you know, see, how do I say all this? Jesus it gets so complicated, right? I mean, take, take, go back to the, the coin flipping. If I take you know, what are the odds of me just flipping 10 coins and, or flipping the coin and hitting 10 consecutive heads 10 consecutive times? Well, the odds are very, very rare, but it depends upon the number of trials. Now, if I start to do, you know, upwards around, you know, 700, 800 trials, well, then there's probably about a one in one chance. I mean, I'm, I'm you know, I'm fairly likely, it wouldn't be surprising at all to have a sequence of 10 consecutive heads in that flip. If I do it for 5,000 or 10,000 times, it's a 99% chance. I mean, it would be highly, highly, highly unlikely to not have a sequence of 10 consecutive heads in there. Now, so here's the issue. The issue is that we say okay, so, so where is the information by which probability is known? See, the coin doesn't have a memory. People have memory, and people can have the context to recognize what, when improbable events have occurred. 
Now, see, I, all this stuff about probability and improbability is so important because it does it very much relates to the difference and the relationship between energy, matter, and information. And I'm going to apologize again. If, if some of this you, you find irritatingly complex, please check out Grammatical Man and the rules are no game. Um, so, I mean, part of the, the, the issue would be that, that at the level of, of matter and energy, we want to say that entropy represents the value of the ability to do work on an ever-decreasing slope. That is, if energy is the capacity of a system to do work, and we see the entire physical chemical system moving in a direction toward increasing disorder, which means eventual, we'll call it heat death, and or loss of any capacity to do work. What's interesting is that information is negative entropy. That is, information is what allows life and organisms, through goal-seeking of various levels and of various sorts, to use information to structure and organize the capacity to do work and it does so through memory and context. Yeah, memory and context bear an informational load which is negative entropy and by that I mean it reduces uncertainty. By reducing uncertainty it gives order. It diminishes the randomness, it takes what would be increasingly unpredictable and makes it more predictable through redundancy. And redundancy happens at multiple levels. See, one of the most important, one of the most important features of information, at least information that we'll say is successfully neg negative entropy, is, is successfully creating the conditions of order for uh, for organismal goal seeking is that it has to include lots of kinds and levels of redundancy so not only saying the same thing over in different ways and repeating oneself and, and back stitching but the rules of grammar the the rules of how sentences can be produced are themselves at a different level of abstraction, but they inbuild kind of redundancy. And by that I mean their negative entropy in that they reduce uncertainty as to the probability of certain occurrences happening. So if I, you know, if you look down on a page and you see the letter TH, the odds of the next letter being a vowel are very high. Well, why is that? See, when you're able to predict the probability of the next letter from a couple of sequences, what you're doing is you're allowing various forms of information, context, redundancy within the informational system to create the awareness by which we construct what is this thing called probability probability in the field of probability, the mathematical realm of probability and how probabilities play out in science, it's probably the most important realm to get at if you want to radically problematize the subject-object split. And it was a wonderful little chapter here and it, you know both of these you want to study the books but the the final chapter of each of them is so fascinating. You know this one has an afterword called Aristotle and DNA and really talks about how much Aristotle's notion of formal cause and final cause deal with a kind of information as it relates to metabolic growth possibilities. It, it, you know, it, it's sort of like he's suggesting, uh, again, a very important recovery of of certain Aristotelian insights and how those relate to DNA. That is it's part of the problem of those who would get on board with the fully Darwinian view is that they got to be very careful not to reinscribe the subject-object split. I've noticed it on some people here who, when they respond, they 
they're not recognizing the degree to which, yeah, if humans are continuous with are continuous with the rest of the natural world, and we're organisms in a, a stream and a continuity of of life. Again, various degrees of, of you know differences of degree have become differences of kind, but you know DNA and the the various. Uh, I guess the way that even inorganic matter is always the the ground bed um, through which organic matter emerged out. I mean, to, to I guess to get at some of that, it really problematizes the way that entropy had only been applied, pri you know, traditionally to physical and chemical systems, basically closed systems, and then now it's as if the only kind of robust sciences will be, the really robust sciences, will be those that are going to be able to see how negative entropy and the level of information and the level of life, both at the DNA and as well as information use of indexicals, icons, and symbols at, at the human level. And this is where, you know, Anthony Wilden, who is doing a lot of work on Campbell, he's also a Gregory Bateson scholar, uh, is one of Bateson's probably best uh, scholars, he's also a Lacan scholar, but his final chapter in here, just an amazing book, uh, it's, it's, again, it's a postscript, but it's called uh, Context Theory, The New Science. Context Theory, The New Science. And it has fascinating tables and summary overviews of what he calls the old view, which excludes the new view, and then the new view, which also includes the old view. And it, it's really fascinating how he's trying to deal with some of the problems of integrating the the way that information and informational goal seeking or you know that's part of it's an essential part of life and to try to look at problems of coding redundancy um i guess capacities for for directedness toward the future by way of abstract representation and uh, for it's worth, uh, I hope that people would check out those books. You want to respond more. Let's let's talk more about the problems of probability. Is probability simply a function of the world? Is it simply a function of something subjective? Or is probability, I'm going to say it is, one of the exemplars of that science, which we're going to have to address in order to show how some of the divisions between the knower and the known are very problematic. Okay, thanks.